Welcome to the Beat by Beat podcast with Armani Exchange. I'm Emerald, I'm a DJ, presenter and broadcaster. And each episode, I'll invite a different musical guest to talk to them about their talent and their musical journey. My first email address was musicismylife11. <laughs> but my closest friends have always said you belong in music. All you ever talk about, all you ever dream about is music working in clubs that changed into becoming a radio presenter that then became DJing and it wasn't until last year when it all came together and I left my full-time job with confidence that I thought I'm 30 years old and I think I'm ready to say that I might want to stay in this industry forever and I was very blessed to be invited to do the DJ workshops in Calcutta which is really cool because I'm Indian myself it's one thing being involved with projects with women or girls in the UK or in Europe but it's another thing when you go to the other side of the world and the problems are a lot different to the problems we have here being able to be let in to a venue when you're not escorted by another man Armani Exchange has reflected the electronic music space since the brand was born evoking the idea of connection and unity exchange is about the coming together of different people united by a shared passion for the dance floor this is episode three. So I am very excited to be welcoming my third guest to the series, the wonderful, most gorgeous, wondrous woman. Her name is Jotty. Hello, Jotty. How are you? What an intro. Wondrous. <laughs> I've never been called wondrous before. Have you ever been called wondrous and wonderful in the same sentence before? Absolutely never, and I don't think anyone will ever live up to that ever again. That's amazing. <laughs> well, it's always a pleasure to talk to you, Jotty, because you and I have been working together for a long time now. Yeah, it's been years now, little, little radio sisters. It's been, it's been wicked. Every time we chat together, every time we link up, it's a party. Let's talk about you. Let's talk about your musical journey, your musical career, your talent, you as a person, and I want to take it all the way back to the beginning, to the beginning of when you first discovered electronic music. Do you remember that time at all? Do you remember those moments? Do you remember where you, where you were when you first discovered electronic music? Hmm. So I think in my case, it's a bit of like a, a period of time in my life growing up. So I was born and raised in Amsterdam and I really grew up in the hip hop scene. You know, with, uh, just like all around culturally. So not just the music I was listening to, but also, you know, the clothes I used to wear. And I was a sneakerhead. And, you know, it was like Spike Lee movies. That, all, that was the only type of film I would watch. And I think when I was growing up, there was this understanding of it's either you're on the hip hop and soul side of things or you're into electronic. And that was just like one, one thing massed together against the better knowledge of, the roots of that music actually all coming from, you know, the same place and that's black and brown people. And I think it wasn't until I kind of around the age of 11, 12, uh, I discovered jungle um, and garage first. Uh, I was listening to like, I think it all started with like shy effects, uh, shake your body or move your body. That was like my in introduction track. And then from that, it kind of went into electronic sounds that had more obvious um, samples or use of rootsy music, right? So without knowing that all of that music actually comes from, from Black people, it was more um, music that sampled certain vocals or had a lot of dub in it or like the usage of reggae. And one thing led into another, and then, you know, you kind of go, oh, wait a minute, house music. And they're like, oh, this is Detroit house, mu house music or Chicago. And they're like, oh, actually, I like this type of techno. I always thought all techno sounded the same, but actually I like the kind that is a lot more melodic and has a lot of, like, um, heavier vocals on it. And I think during my teenage years, when I started also raving a lot more, that's when I really came to understand what kind of electronic music I liked. When I was 22, moved to London, started studying and became a door girl at a club in East London, The Nest. 
that's where I really kind of wish not just a consumer of the scene anymore, but kind of started working in that scene. So every weekend we have the most amazing up and coming acts that have now blown up to be like Grammy nominated and like the most sought out producers in the electronic world. Um, and I would just see them in a basement with 300 other people. Uh, that's when I really kind of became part of the scene myself. So yeah, long, uh, long answer to your short question. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's all relevant and it's all personal to you. And I guess there isn't always just one moment as well. It can happen over a long period of time. Yeah. And it's hard, it's hard to pinpoint those moments, right? At the inception of, of when you started, you know, your, 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 your journey through, through your musical career. But was there a time for you where you realized, or do you remember the time when you realized what I'm doing now, what you're doing now, is what you wanted to do for the rest of your life. Mm. So I think that's maybe really been very, very recent. I would say in the last two years, maybe even. My first email address was music is my life 11. <laughs> that's, my, that's my very first email address. My mum reminded me of that last year. <laughs> so I knew from a young age and also I've got a book um, from when I was about six or seven in school where you had to draw yourself in 20 years and I'd drawn myself on a stage performing to thousands of people and I always thought I was going to be a singer and throughout school I used to sing a lot and I used to do lots of recitals and lots of performances and around the age of 18 when I went to uni I just I don't know the reason why but one day I stopped singing I just stopped singing and I think it was because all my nearest and dearest friends all worked in the music industry and I felt really overwhelmed and I felt like there was no need for me in that world. But my closest friends have always said, you belong in music. Like what all you ever talk about, all you ever dream about is music. And it wasn't until in the last five years, okay, working in clubs, that changed into becoming a radio presenter. That then became DJing. Then that turned into starting my own print music magazine. Then I started curating. Then I started touring. And one thing led to another. And it wasn't until last year when it all came together and I left my full-time job with confidence that I thought, okay, you know what? I'm 30 years old and I think I'm ready to say that I might want to stay in this industry forever. So it really took a long time of me proving to myself more than anybody else. I, I might not be a singer, but there's so many other things I can do in this world that I'm actually really good at. And a lot of them involve putting other people on, whether that's writing about them, talking about them, playing their music. And I think that you can make a career out of that. So that, that's when I accepted it. When the world was going up in flames, I kind of found my, my calling. <laughs> good timing. Yeah. Great timing. Yeah, I think it, it takes a lot of confidence, I think, to make that step where where you, you even just call yourself a DJ. If someone asks you what you do, I'm like, I'm a DJ. And it feels weird and unnatural at the beginning, doesn't it? But I feel like once yeah. you kind of make that transition internally, you know, you, you start gaining that confidence and you're just like, you know what, I'm going to say this with my chest now. But it can take a while. It can take a while for you to be ready inside. But let's rewind a little bit. Let's go back to Amsterdam. You moved from Amsterdam to London. You took your whole life from Amsterdam to London. What was that like for you? How old were you? It was fun, you know, because I was 22. I was, you know, when you're 22 and you think you know everything and you're ready to take on the world. I speak the language. I spoke English fluently. So that there was a lot of things that I think for some people can be quite daunting when they move to another place. And I got to move to a city where no one knew who I was. And I completely got to kind of create my identity from scratch, which is really nice. Because I think in Amsterdam, I was a bit, bit, I was bitter in Amsterdam. I didn't feel loved and I didn't feel understood. And I, I didn't feel like people in the, specifically in the music industry took me seriously or would have even taken me seriously if I'd tried. Because there was already an image of who I was because everyone already knew me from the age of 14, 15, because it's a small city. And did you feel more acceptance when you came over to London? 
Absolutely, 100%. And this is, I say this with a lot of love to my city now. Now I'm older and I put things into perspective. But, you know, it, you can't deny that a city like London, there's a space and a place for everybody. Uh, nothing's too much. You know, like no one's too eccentric. And I think when I was still living back home during those Days, you know, Amsterdam has really rapidly grown into being a metropole city, but it wasn't like that back then. Like now you go back home, everyone speaks English, there's loads of expats, everything feels very big city like. When I was still then, I was 18, 19, 20, it felt like Amsterdam, a cute city in the Netherlands, and everything was always too much. Like, why are you so loud? Why do you dress like that? Why would you wear so much makeup? We have a saying in Dutch which literally translates into just be normal because then you're crazy enough. And that's really a saying people live by back home. How can you say it in Dutch? Uh, do my normal, dan doe je al gek genoeg. So I think when you hear that your whole life and then you come to a place like London where nothing is ever considered crazy, uh, <laughs> you just think, oh, hang on a minute. I get to play around and I get to experiment. And also I think you don't have to justify why you like something. And that was really important for me for clubbing. I worked at a venue where every night the genres and the sounds and the artists would be different, but the crowd wouldn't necessarily change. It was the same people enjoying all the different things. I feel a very similar way to you in terms of moving from where your home is to moving into London, like proper London. I mean, I'm from the outskirts of Southwest London originally, but moving into Hackney and, and coming into that place where you feel like you can never be too eccentric and you can fully express yourself. It's, it's almost funny when you go back home. I, I always have this feeling like, I feel like I'm dressed like I'm in a music video when I go back yeah. home and I'm walking down the high street and I'm like, people are gonna think I'm nuts because I am so, look so out of place right now, you know? You know, even in, in the UK, like forget London, but in the UK, there is a culture of, and when I say pre-drinks, it's not about the drinks or the consuming of anything, alcohol or non-alcoholic, but it's this whole ritual of coming together before hitting the clubs, right? And for a lot of, uh, not, it's not even just girls, it's just anyone, whatever you identify as, it's just the getting in the mood and whether that goes hand in hand with doing your hair and your makeup and watching the game, like that doesn't matter. But every time I'm back home, I caught myself now of getting in that mind state of the pre-drink and the, my friends are not really about that. And I always think, oh, you just put something on and it's not a big deal and you just enter the club at 1 a.m. Whereas I now, I'm like, I want to wear this and on my eyeliner has to be 16 different colors and my hair, because I want to be a character. I want to get a step into like my superhero persona that night. Who are Sick. Yes, the UK. Come on, the UK. <laughs> I want to talk about Boiler Room because mm. for you, Boiler Room has evolved because oh, you, yeah. you were managing events at Boiler Room. You were behind the scenes a lot of time. Then you were hosting a lot of the time and then you had your own show. You had your own Boiler Room stream, which popped off as well. <laughs> how did that transition work and how did it feel, that journey from going from behind the scenes to in front of the scenes to in the scenes? It felt quite natural because I think so. I was always doing the doors. I was guestist girl and Skinny, who has been part of the original team at Boiler Room. He used to always meet me at the nest on the, on the strip in Dalston. And he, he was aware of how I handled big crowds quite nonchalant and like easily. So he's like, okay, we're going to start doing regular events which are open to the public. And I'm going to need someone who knows how to raise their voice and put their foot down. And I did that for years. And it wasn't until I, my radio show started becoming a little bit more known and successful where I think what happened within the boiler room office is they were really aware of the fact that they always had men on camera and they themselves wanted to change that. So they thought, okay, well, we've got someone who, all the visitors already know, like everyone who's ever come through a Boiler Room event has already seen her. She's comfortable with talking on the microphone. So they slowly were like, okay, do you want to try chatting on the microphone? And I said, yeah, why not? And then I got to program a few as well, which was really cool, um, especially ones back home in, in Amsterdam. And then I got a call up from Ahad, who was a 
back then curating shows. And he said, um, I think it's time for you to make your debut. And that, and that didn't feel natural. So everything felt natural before that point. So from going outside to coming inside, behind the scenes, curating. But that part, when I um, actually had to be the person DJing and someone else announcing me, was terrifying. Mm-hmm. I almost felt some sort of guilt or like I had to justify that they knew me. And like, a, like an imposter syndrome kind of thing. Yeah. And, and, and I just, I don't know, I had like all these lines ready in my head of what I would say to people who would say, yeah, well, they picked you because they already knew you. But then it turned out, look, I'm going to be really honest. Look, that set is like two and a half years ago now. When I look back, hey, I cringe because the mixing, not great. I, I, I feel like that with every live stream I've ever done. I feel like I wasn't ready. I should have waited to do it and I cannot watch it back. And I wouldn't dream, I wouldn't dream of doing that set again like that ever. Um, it's crazy, but you know what? I've, um, because it went viral again during lockdown, well, last November, someone decided to post it on TikTok without me having a TikTok and it blew up. And it really, I had to tell myself, It doesn't matter how you feel about it. People like it for a reason. So don't, I've now stopped justifying why people like it so much. If it, if you don't hear all the clans (laughs) and you really enjoy the energy of the room and the beautiful people around me dancing and how much fun we're all having and the fun song selections that I picked, then you know what? That run, that'll run for me. I've stopped being really harsh on myself. Which is something I think in your 20s, throughout that whole period of your 20s, I feel like it's just a constant learning curve on how to be nice to yourself. I agree. I always try to tell myself, but also other people, like younger people, or when I say younger, I mean younger in their career, not necessarily by age, but people who start their creative journey. I'm always just be like, you know what, you need to celebrate your progress because We are always made to feel like as soon as you tick something off your bucket list, then you're on to the next thing. Mm. But really and truly, if you played to 50 people six months ago and now you're playing to 100, pat yourself on the back. That's that's progress. Yeah. And I need to constantly, consciously tell myself, enjoy it, live in the moment, celebrate it. Don't immediately move on to the next bigger, better thing, because that way you're just never going to really be happy. When you are prepping for a live show or a live stream, as we're living in live stream era at the moment, what's your process when you're selecting, when you're putting a mix together? What's your process of selection? Well, when we used to do live shows, um, I would always do a little bit of research, see like, what is the crowd like? What were their previous lineups? Just to understand what their crowd is kind of expecting, but also always reminding myself you got booked for you. So it's a give and take. So I want to know what they like and then give it my own spin or even better yet, I'm going to play what I like, but make sure I give it their spin a little bit. I don't prepare sets per se in the sense of that. I know what I'm going to play for 19 or minutes or two hours, but I will know what songs I definitely want to throw into the mix at some point. So I have a folder of definitely play this because it's brand new and I haven't played it out before or I know that no one's ever heard this before because my friend just made this song last weekend or I just got this demo. Mm -hmm. And then I have folders of my favorite like go-to genres. So it's more like by genre or vibe. So I have folders that will say UK classics or throwback hip hop and R&B or like dancehall bangers. And then I have a folder that says edits and remixes that is then also ordered by mm. kind of speed or BPM. And then um, and then I kind of know what I do for the first five or 10 minutes. And after that, I just let the crowd kind of guide me into yep. where I need to go. Whereas with, with live streams, I think with live streams, it's a complete freestyle from start to finish. Like as soon as I press play, I'm like, well, Let's see what we're going to start off with. Yeah, that's so interesting you say that because I'm the complete opposite. For live streams, I plan it from start to finish meticulously because I know that's going to live online forever and I want that to li- I want you to hear it back as a, a mix that goes through correctly with the right sound. It goes, do you know what I mean? It should flow correctly. But then when I'm playing out, when I'm playing out, I don't know what just happened. 
know, actually, that's really interesting because I think maybe the reason why I kind of freestyle the whole online thing is because I just let the chat tell me what they want. Because the difference is with the streaming, for me at least, is, you know, when you're playing into a crowd, you can't hear, you, the crowd can't really talk to you, even, even if you're surrounded by them. It's not an environment where someone's going to actually communicate through language. Mm -hmm. Whereas with these live streams, people can explicitly type how they feel or what they really enjoyed or do you have more of that so I'm just a bit like well you guys tell me what we what we want to do tonight and then do you know what I mean yeah okay well in that case we're talking about a particular kind of live stream we're not talking yeah. about a boiler room or a keep hush we're talking about twitch aren't we yes yeah <laughs> boiler room as well I feel like that that 2019 boiler room I knew what I was going to do for the first 10 minutes and then after that, I had no clue. Um, but then I did one the year after, which not a lot of people know about. I did a Boiler Room in Isolation, which is my favorite set mm -hmm. that I thoroughly loved. Um, and with that, I did something similar. So I knew the songs. I knew the song I was going to start with, the first three songs, and I knew the last song I was going to play. Okay. And then everything in between kind of felt natural. But that set I absolutely love, and I love the transitions and stuff. But the live live streams on Twitch, particularly where the chat plays a really big role, that there the chat runs runs the decks really. All right, so so Twitch, 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 Twitch. You are the stream queen on Twitch. You really are yeah. the stream queen on Twitch. <laughs> and you know what? I'm very new to Twitch. My first experience with Twitch was only the other day. It is its whole own entity. It's fascinating. What's it been like, your experience with Twitch lately? How have you been interacting with it and how, how, does, it, how does it feel? Well, it's really been the one thing that's kept me, not even just sane, but it's the one thing that kept me not even wanting things to go back to normal because I've just not been aware of what's been going on outside of my flat. Because every time I've gone online and, I, and we turn the stream on, it's the same family that joins the family keeps growing and growing and it's so weird because I feel like I really know my Twitch family and then all of a sudden sometimes someone will DM me after being in my Twitch stream for two three months and I realize that this particular person isn't a small dainty girl who's in college it's actually really six foot something hinge dude who works in finance I'm like, oh, and I he's know. sliding in the dms as well <laughs> it's, it's so funny though because it's like it takes me back to the days of myspace and msn where you really built these friendships with people you don't physically see mm -hmm. and it's all based on like mutual experiences or jokes and just the nature of your messaging and it's really, it's gotten me through this whole, it's been a year now, and it's really gotten me through this whole mm. lockdown because first I was streaming, the first two lockdowns I was streaming via Instagram. And then I think in this last lockdown, I, I switched over to Twitch and the chat is makes the whole difference. Yeah, It's the interactive pers the aspect of it that's so good. Yeah, for real. I mean, streaming has, has been a real positive that's come out of this pause. And just technology in terms of the advancements that have happened and how much we've, we've been learning over, over this pause is definitely something that's, that's been a positive that's come out of it. But obviously definitely. the pandemic has been tough. It's been really, really tough. And there have been a lot of negatives over the past year of 2020 and the past few months of 2021. But let's talk about the positives. Other than finding this new stride in Twitch and in streaming and and really finding comfort there, what's the experience been like for you? What are the positives that have come out of it for you? I want to just clarify with everything that I'm going to answer, it's not forgetting about people that have been heavily impacted, but it's just speaking on uh, my own experiences and some of my peers and my friends and kind of collating the positives, mm -hmm. but not forgetting about all the negatives. But for me, I think, being given the time, being forced to think about why I'm doing what I'm doing. Because mm -hmm. when you get stopped of doing everything, especially in the first lockdown where we hadn't completely figured out how to do radio shows and podcasts and shooting things on location, there was a good two, three months of 
okay, wait a minute. So why am I doing these things? And do I actually want to continue doing them? And if so, how can I make them better and put more love into all of the, the things I do? And I also think we've just come closer together through through the internet. I think the internet has always uh, been something that has divided and united us at the same time. Mm. But this pandemic has definitely highlighted that. And it's, it's also not just because we've gone through like a global pan pandemic. We went through a, a recession, a race war, and it was just everything thrown at us at the same time. And I think we really had the opportunity to stop and think about why things happen around us and why we, if we think they're okay or not, and to well, voice our opinions and kind of, I don't know, live in the moment and just be a little bit more still because who are you if you can't see your friends? And who are you if you're not dedicating 50, 60, 70 hours of your life a week to work? And who are you if you take away escapism whether that's traveling or going to a club but why are you going to a club and why are you spending so much money to on these things so it's been really good it's been tough but i think the outcome of it is going to be really positive it's been a, a lot of, a difficult journey for a lot of people but it's been a collective difficult journey yeah so it's like this collective trauma that we're going through and hopefully we find ourselves a little, it's like maybe one percent closer to ourselves uh, on on the other end of this, whatever you want to call it. And I think that's been really positive. Maybe we don't see it now, but I think if we look back at this a year from now, you're going to think, you know what, I've grown in different ways. People have become better at their jobs. People have become better partners, better children to their parents. A lot of people have gained a lot of understanding, a lot more sympathy, sympathy. And I think those are the positive really. For real, I think there's a new equilibrium is being created. And mm, hopefully, big words, Emily. yes. Thank you. And I think that hopefully we don't just dive back into the way things were and we'll take some stock and some lessons from this experience, for real. Definitely. I want to speak about you giving back to the community because this is something that I think is very important to you. And I want you to tell us a little bit more about the DJ workshops that you did for women in Kolkata with the British Council, as well as the course you did for leading young British Asian women into breaking into the music industry. Tell us a little bit about those projects. Yeah, those have been, I think, um, all my favorite things I've been lucky enough to do as um, a DJ, presenter, whatever, uh, are the projects that had something to do with community. Um, the thing with British Council and Wild City was a program that they had curated over a few months, uh, and it took place in New Delhi, Calcutta, and I believe also in Bangalore. And I was very blessed to be invited to do the DJ workshops in Calcutta, which is really cool because I'm Indian myself, and I've been to a lot of places in India, but not to Calcutta yet. It's one thing being involved with projects with women or girls in the UK or in Europe. But it's another thing when you go to the other side of the world and the problems are all of a sudden a lot different to the problems we have here. Here, you know, not saying that they're less important, but here the very important thing is equal opportunity and being heard and being seen behind the decks, being seen on lineups and bills and posters. And then you go there and it's being able to be let in to a venue when you're not escorted by another man. Or it's being allowed on the decks because you have to explain to your family that it doesn't go hand in hand with prostitution and drug culture. It, it just, you know, it went so much deeper and it was like, oh, you know, it, it means if you go to a security guard in a club and you said that um, the son of a very wealthy and prominent politician has just invaded your space, that you're being taken seriously and you're not being sent away because you're wearing a mini skirt and you've consumed some alcohol, mm -hmm. you know? So all of a sudden I got there and I, I thought, oh, my, <laughs> this is a whole different 
of problems that I haven't faced per se and that I didn't even think were an issue until I got here and I started talking to all you guys. So the whole reward on the other end of seeing people becoming more confident and them interacting with each other and creating these collectives that now have their own radio shows and they're taking over club residencies. It was just the next level of, mm. of, of being proud to have and grateful to be a part of that. And then to come back to London and do another six week course with um, South Bank for young South Asian women to recently doing a 24 hour stream with daytimers for raising money for the farmers protest in India, et cetera, et cetera. There've been so many other kind of spin-offs of that, that it's just a gift that keeps on giving. And a lot of the girls that I taught, uh, especially in the London workshops, they are now doing workshops themselves, which is crazy to see. So it's just the gift that keeps on giving. You know, someone gave me an opportunity. I then got to give back. And now those girls are giving back. And I just think it's just never going to stop. It's great. I think it's fantastic. And I think that it's so important. And even just you talking about it on a platform like this, and even you just talking to me here is progress in itself. And it's perspective that I think a lot of people need. Yeah. And yeah, just thank you for all that you do and keep doing it. I know, thank you. I'm glad <laughs> you brought it up because it is genuinely like, it's the thing that makes me the happiest and I want to you know that's also the one thing I miss the most during this lockdown is working with other people in not in the glitz and glamour side of things that we get to do and people get to see but the things that people don't get to see and but I think make the biggest impact have you been dreaming of of anywhere that you wish you could be right now that where you, where you would want to play is there a particular venue or country or club or city Yes, there's a few answers to that question. The first one would be anywhere. <laughs> anywhere. Mm -hmm. If you set up decks at my local supermarket at 11 a.m. <laughs> on a Tuesday, mm -hmm. and you tell me that people, I can play as loud as I want and anyone is free to dance in any aisle as close to people mm -hmm. as they would like to, I'm there. <laughs> Thinking about places that I've already played and that were amazing, I think um, South Africa would be, I, I can't wait to be back in South Africa. I think people combined with the landscape, like the actual nature and the mountains and the oceans and what that looks like and the temperature most of the year. It's my favorite place in the world. Johannesburg is the only place I think I've ever been and I've thought I could live here. Yeah. I think Joburg even over over Cape Town because it's it's uh, more of the people and for the people, right? Mm -hmm. And people um, and people our age are so aware and they're politically aware because they've been through, they've seen trauma firsthand, whereas we're kind of in that weird, in that weird generational gap where we haven't really been through anything. Like this is the worst thing we've probably been through in our lifetimes as a collective. And so it's amazing, isn't it? When you're in those South African cities to interact with people our age who are from so many different cultures as well. There's so many mixed race people there. And it's really interesting to, to be in amongst that. For me, it was like an after party and afters in London, is just a massive piss up, let's be honest. Yeah. <laughs> and you, you form great connections and, and it's, it, those are magical, magical moments because there are no inhibitions and you form amazing connections with people. But an afters in South Africa, the conversations are just on a totally different level. 100%, 100%. And I think all of the things that we've just mentioned, so the people, the history and the, the, the location, and then add into the mix the musical landscape. Maybe that's maybe that should be my only answer to this question, just because it encapsulates everything that we would like. Um, so yeah, uh, when when the gates open, take me back to South Africa, please. Thank Good. you. That's a solid answer. Excellent choice. So Jotty, we've asked you to choose a tune that means something to you. So firstly, can you tell us what that tune is and why does it mean so much to you? 
So I've gone with a song from two artists very close to home. They um, two London boys uh, who go by the name of Hurricane and Airborne Gav. And the reason I picked this song is because it is an electronic song in the sense of how it's made and and what it sounds like and where it can take you and the environment it would do really well in. And they made an EP together. And I think the EP has five songs on there. And then this song, I remember the first time I heard it, I thought, oh, People are not gonna. People are not gonna give this song enough love because they're so low key as artists, and it's just a tune that I don't think as a DJ it matters what your sound is. But if you put this song on, whether it's the start of the night, the middle of the night, or specifically at the end of the night, it's just the song that kind of takes you into a trance from the very simple vocals that explain a very recognizable state of mind. It's very subtle and it's like one of those songs that is kind of like that gospel song in a DJ set without having to play mm -hmm. a gospel song in a DJ set. I think that this song does that. And it's definitely a tune that I would put on when I'm traveling and I'm kind of getting to know new people after a, a gig and you're at someone's house or you're in someone's studio and you want to go, hey, you know what I think everyone should listen to? This is that song. It's just a beautiful sound that transcends genres. Yeah. Wicked. Good choice, Jotty. Thank you, Emerald. <laughs> right, that's it, Jotty. Thank you so much for having a chat with me today and for sitting down for the Beat by Beat podcast with Armani Exchange. It's been a pleasure talking to you as it always is. So thank you. Thank you so much for having me and also just for asking me these questions that I wish people would ask you more so then we get to talk about the things that we really care about. So thank you so much. Thank you very much to the wonderful Jotty and thank you to Armani Exchange and thank you for watching the Beat by Beat podcast. <laughs>